Okay. Okay, so we are recording. It is 6.30. We said that we would start at 6.30 and uh, more people will be coming in. Um, I would like to introduce you to, this is our broker, Larry Jordan. Uh, Larry did my, taught my broker course over at the Real Estate School for Success and is the reason that I ended up joining with Palmetto Real Estate Group. Uh, Larry was talking about all of the amazing ways, um, not just to help people, but really if you're interested in building your own real estate empire, um, this was the, uh, the path for me. This has been the path for me. Since I've been with the brokerage, uh, I have uh, flipped a house. I have um, had some uh, owner financed bank notes. I do a lot with um, option agreements. So there's, uh, the, I know that the Palmetto Real Estate Group, I know that Larry and, and Chad have quite a few rental houses. Um, so there are a lot of different ways and streams of income that people can uh, have in real estate. Um, oftentimes it doesn't take a real estate license and sometimes it does, uh, but the knowledge uh, is absolutely golden the knowledge that we're receiving, I mean, people pay thousands and thousands of dollars for it. So I feel very blessed to have such amazing mentors a phone call away. Yeah, I need to know one of those. <laughs> hey, Bob, how are you? Fine, how are you, Don? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you okay. Nice to see you again. No, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, just so uh, Natasha and, and Zaria, this is, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Robert Kim, Bob Kim. He is the, uh, I want to say curator. I'm not sure what they call you, uh, Bob. <laughs> the gopher. <laughs> gopher <laughs> over at the uh, Real Estate Investors Association, Midlands Real Estate Investors Association. Mm -hmm. They call him Bob, I think. What was that? I think they call him Bob. Dude, they call him Bob. <laughs> Sure, they call him a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, they call him a lot of things too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, some are four-letter words too. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's Thanks, Bob Don. with two Bs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Bob actually also the Midlands Real Estate uh, Investors Association. They meet once a month. Also, they were meeting live. Now they're meeting on Zoom. Fantastic resource. They, their topic on Monday was buying and selling, uh, what was it, storage units, like storage unit facilities. Very interesting insights and information, just things to consider, completely different. So just as another resource, if you're wanting to know more, Midlands, the Midlands RIA group, they have a Facebook page. They um, have their meetings. You can email Bob, bob at midlandsria.com. Is that right? It, it is. Thanks, Don. You didn't have to mention that. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, you know, I really appreciate it. I love sitting in to your seminars. And then also when we we're meeting live, anytime I had a deal going on, I was able to go and present it in front of the group. And I sold, I think my first three, Three of my six listings sold from the very first time I went to your group, just meeting people. So that was pretty great. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you letting me know. Yeah. It works. This stuff works. So, hey, Grace. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we were going to be talking about, uh, we had three different topics. One was, and I'm, I don't have it right in front of me. Just studied my own notes. One was uh, necessary versus unnecessary repairs. How to protect your, which the equivalent of that is how to protect your uh, uh, profit, how to protect your profit, right? How to keep yourself from going bankrupt. Uh, our second topic was, um, yeah, Larry, you can jump in and help me anytime now. Counting your, what was it? Counting? Count the cost. 
Count the cost. That's right. And Count the cost. Mistakes. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And this is the cost of the repairs that you want to do to make sure that it's a good deal and you're not going to go bankrupt or come out upside down on it. And then the other topic was we wanted to talk a little bit about the cost of how, how today's economy is affecting the cost of sales. And Larry had a great point yesterday when he and I were talking, which is right now it's a seller's market and sellers are wanting top dollar for their properties. And as wholesalers who are going in and rehabbing a lot of these properties, top dollar doesn't necessarily translate when the cost of gas just went up 20 cents a gallon, which affects trucking and the industry that is bringing our lumber, our ceiling fans, our lighting fixture. I mean, one is a domino effect for the rest. The cost of lumber, I was reading not too long ago or somebody told me that uh, last year, I think at this time, it was about $125 per square foot to build new. And now the cost has risen to about $236 a square foot if you're gonna build new. So these are conversations that uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, throughout this meeting, just in how to have these first conversations with sellers and how to bring their feet back to the ground when they're wanting top dollar for something that is going to actually cost us a lot more to rehab. I have a house over here in North Augusta. I sold the house as an investment property to a flipper. He bought it. He has been working on it. And since he has owned the house, the cost of lumber has skyrocketed so much. He actually put in a deck and a fence, a wood fence. And he said, normally these items cost about $500 to buy the materials for. And he just paid $3,000 for lumber for a deck and a fence. And that has affected not just his bottom line, but how much now he has to retail this house for. We're going to be putting it back up on the market as a rehabbed you know, move-in ready home, it's very interesting. So the fierce conversations that you have with these people, and we're going to be talking, all of this ties into counting your cost, the cost of the sale, of how much it's going to cost to rehab things, and that sometimes these costs are going to make, you're going to have to make adjustments. Larry, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, no, when you give me some time, I'll go through some of these items. All right, I'm going to hand it over to you. And, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you then. Yeah, we'll spend we'll spend a little while on it. Go ahead. Do you want to start? Uh, you can go ahead, or I can start either. I'm way. gonna I'm gonna hand it over to you right now. All right, we'll go out of order, folks. <laughs> uh, one of the things, in fact. I've I made a little slide if it'll show show up here so you guys can look at what I call counting the cost and common mistakes. So uh, let's see uh, if everybody can see this cartoon if it'll come up. Can everybody see that? Okay, and everybody can hear me, I guess. Um, I call this common mistakes. Everybody wants to get into real estate. People get their license, people want to be an investor, and they go to meetings like this and they get a lot of good information. And Bob, uh, he probably got people that goes to the investors' meetings. But one of the problems is they do nothing. I used to do workshops and people would spend two to three thousand dollars to come spend time with me, get all this information in notebooks, we called it recipes and they did absolutely nothing, or they were inconsistent in what they did, they don't follow the recipe or the ways to do it, or people listen to unqualified advice, or they don't make enough offers. Just for everyone to know, when you're starting out 
and you're learning, you will probably get one deal in 20. One deal in 20. That doesn't sound like a lot. But if you make 20 offers in a week and you get one and you make $5,000 and you do that consistently, that's $20,000 a month. There's people working their fannies off not making that. There's other things that they don't do. There's one in 20 people that might say yes. And I put following. I didn't know what I was writing there, but following. <laughs> so not following up. Some people just aren't ready. And the follow-ups are people that you may get. They're just not ready yet. And part of the analysis that we're looking at is paying too much. And also, we don't want people doing analysis, paralysis, driving themselves and their buyers or sellers insane with going over and over and over particulars that won't make the deal. One of the things I do, if it's the wrong deal, it won't work, or the area is not good for what I want to do, I walk away. So you got... It's uh, there's all used to be old Kenny Rogers song about the gambler. You know when uh, you know when to run and you know when to walk. You know when to count the money, but it's not at the table. All that stuff. Uh, so don't get caught up in the wrong deal, wrong area. Also, this is a big one. So many people let the lack of money stop them in their tracks. There is not a lack of money. Listen to me again. There is not a lack of money in real estates. It's just that you don't know how to get it. And even if you pay 10 or 15% of that money, if you've done your analysis correctly, it's not a lot of money to pay back. And while you're doing this business, you always need to build a buyer's list. So if you do a deal, write that person's name, their email, how much they normally like to spend, how many houses they're looking for, how many deals they're looking for, and keep that list active and contact them on a regular basis, if no more than a text or an email. And here's the other thing. We're at the moment, uh, Don was talking about wholesaling and that kind of stuff. But I'm here to tell you, don't stop at learning one method. There's all kinds of methods in real estate that, that you need to know so that if one type thing goes away, then you can move into another area of real estate. And every one of these areas you got to figure what's the most conducive for you. And here's the thing that I want everybody to remember down at the bottom. Well, first off, get good tutors. Whoever's with you, make sure they know what they're doing. But here's the thing to remember. And let's see if anybody can tell me this. Don, you should know it. I think I showed it to you in class right here at the bottom. Y-C-B-W-S-O-Y-A. Anybody want to guess what that means? I know that you told me, but it's such an odd acronym. I I could guess, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> okay. So whatever we're doing, you cannot do business while sitting on your assets. You agree? Real estate agents that come in the office and hang out by the coffee pot all day never make a sale. Real estate, whether you're investing, whether you're a real estate agent, I always call it a contact sport. If you're not making contacts, new people every day, you're out of business sport. Are you with me? So we're going to talk about some of these things and how to count the cost. And, and what goes on with people. Mostly we're gonna talk about is deals. 
because if you want to be an investor, and that's what we're here with investors, you got to know where to find the deal, what a real deal is, and why people might sell it to you in an abandoned, crazy moment in their life. While we're all here, let me just ask a question. I'll just make sure you're looking your cameras at me a moment. Have you ever done something that after you did it, you couldn't explain why you did it? All been there, right? And you say, I don't know why I did that. that was the dumbest thing in the world. Well, <laughs> people do dumb things. They get a mortgage they can't pay. Do you believe that? They go buy a car they can't afford. We do stuff sometimes. We're just plain stupid. And, and uh, I think, you know, I'm a Christian, and I think about God knew we were stupid. He gave us 10 laws to keep, and then man makes laws. How many laws have ever been made, man or God's, that we didn't break? Every single one of them somebody breaks it. So uh, he had pity on us. The law doesn't sometimes. They lock you up. But let's look at uh, some of the things that you can write down. Do you know that some people just abandon a house? Abandoned houses are all over the place. And if you'll go down to some of your counties, some of your little city municipalities, they will tell you there's houses that are abandoned. And in fact, the city has condemned them because they're abandoned. Did y'all know that? I Can I jump in here real fast? Sure you can. I have the best tool. I was driving down the street and I saw this house that I was hoping to buy. It was abandoned, but somebody had started working on it. And so I wanna, first of all, go back to your point, Larry, about you have to have conversations about real estate. If you're not having conversations about real estate, you will not do any business. That's right. I saw this house that I'd been wanting to buy. I actually sent them a postcard about selling it and never heard back about two weeks later, I'm driving by and I can see that they've started some rehab. So I pulled over, knocked on the door. Nobody was there, but the next door neighbor was home. And I took Larry's tip the neighbors usually know what's going on. So I asked the neighbor, hey, what's going on here? They said, oh yeah, it was just sold. I said, well, hey, this is a super hot neighborhood. You know, anybody else here interested in selling a house because we've got lots of people who are interested in living here. And she actually gave me two contacts, two places just around the corner to go contact. And I drove around the corner and I found one of those places. She said, there was a tree that fell over into this lady's yard. Uh, maybe you can find the people who own the lot that the tree fell out of. Well, I drove around. Not only was the lady whose yard it was that the tree fell in, and that's a whole different story, uh, but there is also, <laughs> no, and this is important too. It's an important story. But there's also the tree cutters that were there. And I said, well, hey, the lady around the corner just sent me over to find out who owns that lot over there. And this guy, one of the tree cutters, and this is why I wanted to jump in, said, oh, I can tell you who owns that lot. He has this deer hunter. Okay, can you see my phone here, right? All the, all the apps. Yeah, we can apps. <laughs> anyway, it's this deer hunter app. It's called Onyx Hunt. And so my, oh, wait a second. Let me turn off this virtual background. Anyway, well, I'll just tell you about this app. What it does is you can pull up with your GPS on, you can pull up in front of any house or in front of any land, click on the app and it will tell you who owns it and what their mailing address is. I, it's right there and I love it. So now every time I see an empty house, I used to have to write down the address and then I'd go home and I'd look it up on the tax records, but I don't have to anymore because now I have an app where I can just pull up that information. So going back to that lady who, whose property that tree fell on, I followed up with her conversation saying, hey, do you know anybody in this neighborhood who might be interested in selling their house? Uh, and I'm asking for sellers because right now we're in a hot seller's market, right? Mm -hmm. I need houses. She said, well, in fact, I've been thinking about selling my house. 
I met with her today to do a CMA for her house. She toured it. Uh, she and I toured it together. We took notes. We talked about talked about updates that she wants to do on the house. And I'm going to be listing that house for her in probably August or September. So all of that came from talking to people. But let me tell you right now, if you talk to 20 people a day about real estate and whatever real estate you want to focus on. you don't get on, one, something's wrong. I keep going in and out? You what did. did you say, Larry? I said, oh, if you good. don't get at least one out of 20, something's wrong. And that, that's why it's the number. If you don't get one out of 20, something is wrong. And you have to ask. And I will stand in the bank line. I will stand at the grocery store line. I was at my dentist having my teeth cleaned. And I, I mentioned to, to the uh, hygienist, hey, do you know anybody interested in buying a house or selling a house or investing in real estate? I could assist. And she said, hey. <laughs> I'm thinking about buying a house in Bend. I said, I've got an agent that I can refer you to. So I actually referred her to an agent in Bend. I actually got on the phone and I actually, I just Googled it, real estate agents in Bend. And I got a, I got a referral out of that. So that's if you're licensed, right? If you're not licensed, that's okay. Because you can ask about, do you know anybody that's interested in selling their house or anybody with a vacant house? Or if you see somebody cutting the lawn of a property that is obviously there's nobody living there, pull over and ask who owns this property. Can you get, can I give you my car? Do you think they're interested in selling? If you have 20 conversations a day about real estate, you will be, or whatever it is you want to be successful in. If you have 20 conversations a day, you will be successful. So on Absolutely. that, I'm going to hand it back to you, Larry. Okay. Well, these, these abandoned houses that we're talking about, um, Sometimes people are elderly, go to a nursing home. Um, sometimes um, they passed away and the family's out of state. So you can find those houses that are in probate. Uh, the thing to know that probate does not take a year. It can happen immediately. All the court has to do is approve the sale. If the owner has got a property that's in probate and uh, you want to buy it, you need to talk to the owners and we have, that's another workshop really, probate sales. I'm doing that right now. We have, yeah, yeah it's an investment property. It's a hundred percent investment property. It's not listed. I have the option right. to buy it. I've assigned it. Uh, one of the, uh, the parents devised it to three children. One of those three children has passed on and now it's uh, that lady's daughter and her two uncles, this lady's, the daughter's two uncles that are mm. selling it together. And the house has to go into probate before we can transfer it. So I went to the Aiken courthouse, picked up the paperwork for the daughter, and she is opening probate. But we have a closing date of the 19th, of May 19th. So long as probate is open, we can close on that house and everyone gets paid. So. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to throw that in. So there's a bunch of those. There's some people that maybe have a house that their parents had and is run down and they don't think it's worth anything. And so they just let it sit there and rot. Hey, it's okay. If they'll give it to me, I'll take it. I don't care what the condition is. The lot's worth it. Um, so there's uh, another thing. Some people have a house they want to sell, but they know it's not going to sell in that condition. Here's a trick. And I've been doing it, and and I just found out there's people on television getting paid for what I invented, and they didn't pay me. Uh, <laughs> sometimes there's people that would like to sell a house, but they know the condition of the house is such that they can't really market it well. Well, their payments, say, $400 or something, they can make the payment, but that's about all they can do. How about this? You find somebody that's got some money that'll lend you to fix up the house, or you got it. You got $20,000. You go to that owner and say, look, your house in the condition it's in is worth, let's just pick a number, $80,000. Y'all with me so far? Shake your heads like I know you're listening. Um, and it's going to take $25,000 to fix it up and you don't have the money, right? All right, right. Suppose we fix it up, 
I make it really nice. I pay for all that. And when we get down, we'll sell it. And I'll, we'll get the commissions and everything paid. Everything that's left, we split 50-50. Is that a good deal for you that you didn't have to buy the house? You didn't have to make mortgage payments. You didn't pay the light bill. The only thing you did was get it repaired with either your money or somebody else's. And the deal is whatever it costs you to do it, including borrowing that money, is a cost that you get back before you split 50-50. And if you're a real estate agent, you should still get a realtor fee too, shouldn't you? because your company has to be paid, which you get some of that too. You all with me? So that's an easy way to get a house when people are having a hard time and can't keep it up. There's people that are in foreclosure that'll give you the deed. They're behind two or three payments. Listen, if the payments are $800 a month and they owe three payments, it's only $2,500. May sound like the moon, but I can promise you, every one of you here right now knows somebody that's got $2,500 that will give it to you to invest in real estate. Um, some, some people may not even be aware they own a house. Um, this is a true story. Uh, we found a house, went to look it up and found of all things, it was given to a church in a will. The church didn't know they owned it. We went to the church, said, hey, what y'all doing with the house, da, 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 da. Pastor, I don't know anything about that house. The church didn't know anything about the house. We showed them the, where it had been deeded to them. And we said, would you like to do something? They said, well, we don't know. And I said, well, here's the thing right now. It's in really sad shape. You may have squatters that you don't know. If they get hurt, the church can have a liability, but either you need to sell it or get over there and take care of it. How much will you give me for it? Not much, make me an offer. We did, they took it. Because the church had rather have the money than an old beat up house, right? So we bought it for a little bit of nothing, repaired I'm super, it. I'm super glad you brought that up because on that deer hunting app that I was talking about, I had some signs in front of some vacant houses and um, I went back and the signs were gone and I looked up who owned the houses. There are two vacant houses. I mean, literally falling down side by side and a church owns them. And mm -hmm. so now I'm going to go to those churches to the church and say, Hey, I mean, what church wouldn't love a $10,000, you know, 5,000, 10,000, $20,000, um, donation because it's yeah. tax deductible yeah. yeah so that happens but life circumstances bring people to do different things and if you can get in front of them give them a card give them a piece of paper do something i've had people call me three years after i talked to them at their house something happened and they came back later so let's talk about some of the things Counting the cost, what does it take to decide if you want to buy a house or not, or if you can pay it? Uh, and there's some rules in this, but I wanted to talk to you about the rules. I'm going to give you a list of things to consider in buying a home. So y'all write them down. I don't have them on a thing. But when, when you're getting ready to make an offer on real estate, and it's an investment for you, you make your money when you buy the house, when you make the offer. And these are the things you need to know in your mind and write down so that you know how to make your offer. You need to consider a commission. Now you might think, well, I'll just sell it myself. Well, you're one person. In Columbia, South Carolina area, there's about 4,000 real estate agents. Who do you think has a better chance of selling your house, you or them? So put in their six or 7% commission in your cost to buy. Also, most people want some kind of, you to pay some of the closing costs, two or 3%, figure that in there. Um, also- Can I add something real yeah. fast? 
thanks. I sold an investment property, had the option on it. This is over in Aiken. I sold it to a real estate agent in Columbia. She is an active agent in Columbia and felt that driving to Aiken was too far for her to list the house herself. So even though she is an active real estate agent in Columbia, she listed the house with me in Aiken. She's paying me our brokerage 6%, you know, while we're going to you know, split it to sell her house. And this is a licensed agent. And she figured that 6% into her bottom line. I was shocked. Yeah. Well, if you include it in your cost, it's no cost. So also, um, usually in most markets, not today, but most part, people want to say, okay, your house is selling for 180, I'll give you 175. They are in some kind of discount. Realtors commission discounts and selling will run about nine to 12% of your cost. So you just kind of keep that in your mind. While a person's in their house, are they usually making a house payment? That's a cost they never get back. Y'all understand that? Because most of it is interest. So if you're if you've got a holding cost, you've borrowed money, you got to figure the cost of that money, what's it costing you that you can get it back later to be whole. Make sense? Also, while you're working on that house, restoring it, you're going to have electric bill, water bill. Keep those things in mind. You probably need to have insurance on that house, even if it's an investment property, because if it burns down, now you're out of luck completely or gets hit by lightning. Uh, you're going to have to maintain the exterior of your house as an investor. You want the front of that house looking best from the moment you can get in there and do it. When people riding by, you want them to see the outside looks great. They're not coming in the door if the outside looks like a trash bin. Y'all agree? Because they, their first, you know, first sight is what they look at. When you go over there and clean up the yard first, people are going to start asking you. They're going to knock on the door before you even get anything finished. What are you doing? The neighbors will come over. The neighbors will start cleaning up their yard because you're cleaning up yours. Um, you have to figure out what an appraiser is going to cost if you need a survey or not, um, what kind of property taxes you're gonna have to pay on this thing if you hold it one month, two months, three months, four months. Uh, and also there's what's called a transfer tax. Don, you wanna tell them what a transfer tax is? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so a transfer tax, you know, the municipality of whatever is always going to get their money. Uh, the transfer tax charges the seller to transfer the property to the buyer. It is paid at $3.85 for every $1,000 of purchase price. So if the purchase price is $100,000, that's going to be $385 in transfer tax. I call that double taxation, by the way. It is. Because you're getting taxed when you pay your property tax, but when you sell your house, they want some more. Did I do that right? Wait, I think it's $30.85 if it's $100,000. $3.85. Yeah. Times 100 is uh, $30. Yeah. So if it's a $100,000 house, $385. I don't know about you, but if the state would give me $385 every time they saw something, I would take it. But part goes to the county and part goes to the state. Like they don't get enough already. Um, also, you got to figure out your repair list, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. And you may need a home warranty to go with it. That's about 500 bucks. Um, and then they may require a termite letter or an inspection of some kind. All of those things, when you rehab your house, you have to make sure it's right or it's going to come back and get you. Um, so all of those things are cost. You need to sit down before you make an offer and say, what is my cost going to be in these items to purchase this house? 
Now the rule of thumb uh, is, I'm going to give you a rule of thumb of a hundred thousand dollar house. This is what every real estate thing guru teaches you. A hundred thousand dollar house, they're going to tell you the most you need to offer for a hundred thousand dollar house after it's fixed up. So if they've got a house that you think it's worth 60,000, you figure, okay, if I put money in it, fix it up, it should sell for a hundred. Verify that's a good number. Call Dawn. She can help you with the valuation. Um, so if it's a hundred thousand, you say, okay, I should buy that for no less or no more than 70% of a hundred thousand. So what does that give you folks? Seventy percent times one hundred thousand is seventy thousand dollars. Seventy thousand, right now, that thirty percent takes care of the real estate commissions, all these costs that we just talked about, uh, and gives you about fifteen to twenty percent profit. You with me so far? Now you subtract the cost of repairs. If those repairs that you figured out are $30,000, then you subtract 30,000 from 70. What does that leave you? $40,000. Now, I call that mo. That is my maximum absolutely will not exceed offer. If you go over that, you're not following the right recipe and you're going to pay for it unless you get really, really, really lucky. Y'all with me? That is counting the cost so that you know what you're doing. Don't guess at this stuff. The price of lumber, supplies, everything is changing almost on a weekly basis. If you need help, get help. Go down to Lowe's and Home Depot and just walk through and look at prices. Just how much is a two before? How much is sheetrock? How much is a bathroom kitchen cabinet? How much is a stove? How much is a refrigerator? Uh, you can go online and check it out. Home Depot lets you for free check out all their prices. So get an idea of what it's doing and compare your after repair value to properties. Everybody, you say six months I, or a year. I say check it out six months within the last six months. Dawn, are prices changing every six months? Oh my gosh, even faster than that. I think the gas prices went up 20 cents so far just this week because of the cyber cyber attack on the pipeline. So get, prices are always changing. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be six months. Yeah. So what I determine the rehab cost, I do it two ways. Y'all can make you a sheet of paper and draw a line down the middle. But I usually look at the exterior of the house first. That's what people see first, right? So the exterior, I look, what is the curb appeal? And what I mean by that, not just that house, what do the houses around it look like? If they're all dogs and this one looks the best, you ain't gonna get much better than a dog price. Because people don't like to live next to a dog. Um, I look at the painting. Is the paint peeling? Is it an ugly color? Is it appealing? Or is the, the uh, vinyl or the wood, whatever it is, look at that house. Does it need a roof? Does it look good or bad? Now, roofs, they can look bad, but they can be cleaned sometimes. It's just dirty. It's got fungus and stuff on it. And it can be cleaned off. So that, that might be something to consider. How do the windows look? Are they cracked? Are they old? Is this house built in 1954 and still has 1954 windows? Um, how about the doors, the foundation, right now I've got a house that we have for sale. The foundation is gonna cost $30,000 to fix. Now, that doesn't count just the foundation. Every 
wall in that house is cracked. And I don't mean you can tape it or mud it. The sheetrock has to come down and new sheetrock put up. So look at, look at these things from the point of the repairs. Um, also, if it has a basement, is it leaking? Does it have a sump pump? Is there rotten wood around it? Uh, are you going to need a dumpster to move all the trash off of the properties? Do any trees need to be cut down? Y'all getting with me the cost that you got to think about? Landscaping is normal. landscaping is something people always forget. It's just one of the, they go inside, they look at the house, they look at the broken windows, they think about the HVAC, the roof, but they don't think about the landscaping in the front yard or the backyard. It's just, it's an easy thing to overlook, but always remember the landscaping. That's right, always do that. All right, on the inside, you got the same issues. You got the painting in the inside. What's the sheetrock look like? Does it have holes in it? Are the floor, floor covering just out of date or ugly? Need to be updated. Kitchens, kitchens and bathrooms. Y'all heard this before? Kitchens and bathrooms sell houses, especially today. Houses built in the 50s and 60s were blocks. They just put square blocks together. Today, people like an open floor plan, nice big areas to entertain. So they say they want to entertain, but some people don't. Uh, so you need to look at those items. Does it need an electric upgrade? If you don't know what that means, the panel boxes and the way utilities come into the house. Um, if you don't know, get an electrician to ask you the best panel boxes and how electricity comes into the house. The old houses had a hookup that came in that's out of date today and it's very difficult to get good power to the house. If it doesn't have central air, are you gonna have to put in another box to put central air and heat in the house? Um, Light fixtures, are they out of date? Plumbing, if it's an old house, it may have galvanized pipe that it gets stopped up and rots. And before you know it, you got to replumb the house or rewire the house. Uh, and I always put about 10% just in case on these things because I don't know what I don't know. You all with me? Um, now, what you have to look at, and my little thing says, yes, it needs something or no, it does not. If it doesn't need new light fixtures, don't count them. If it does, say yes, and then figure a cost. Put a cost beside it if you have to go to the store and get a cost. I'm telling you, in today's market, you do not want to miss this. Don't understand how important it is right now? Because if you miss it, you're going to be out of business before you get started. So these are some things that you need to pay real close attention to in counting the cost. Uh, don't, I mean, if you want to get a, somebody in there for you to do this, uh, I would do it. But after a little bit, you're going to get pretty good at it. And you're going to be able to walk through a house. I can walk through a house and Don can probably tell you, in about 10 minutes, I know what the price is going to be to fix that house. I've just been, I've done it more than yesterday. So um, you'll want to do that. And to help you out when you're out looking at houses, riding through neighborhoods, go, go a different way home every day. Go through a neighborhood you haven't been through. Go through it several times. You'll find houses with no mailbox. You'll see houses that the grass has grown up on, magazines laying there, uh, talk to the neighbors, whatever, but take your camera with you. Take a picture of that house, several of them, wherever you're at, take pictures of those houses. Somebody keep trying to call me. And um, on a piece of paper, write down, like brick house, blue shutters, green door. Because if you don't do that and you've taken 20 pictures of houses, do you think you're going to remember what house was what? So write down the address of the property, 
a description of the house so when you get back with your camera, you can determine what house it is that you're looking at. Okay? That makes sense to you guys a little bit? Don, I should be charging for this. Well, you're doing such a great job, you know. Um, <laughs> so, and on your little sheet, uh, you might make a sheet with the picture of the house and your little graph with the inside outside repairs. So you have it all on one sheet of paper. I mean, if you get everything on one sheet of paper, right? I'm holding a sheet of paper in my hand. You can't see it there. Let's see. Like, I don't even think you can see it. But if you get it all on one sheet, now you got one sheet of paper with everything you need. Picture the house, your cost, your maximum offer that you can pair. Now, here's what I tell people when I make them an offer. And they say, well, I want to think about it. I said, we're fine. Take all the time you want. I'll call you tomorrow. How long does it take to make up a decision? When people say, well, I'm going to get some other prices. I said, well, you can do that, but mine won't change. If you get a better offer, take it. I'm not trying to be mean, but what did I tell you about Mo? It is the maximum offer you will make. Whether you're saying I'm giving you an option or if you're going to buy it, or you're going to take over the payments, your maximum offer should be your maximum offer. Can I now, add to that? Huh? I just want to add to that for a second. I looked at a house uh, over in Augusta and it needed some rehab. It was one of those buy my house, you know, fast things. It needed some rehab. It was a nice house in a nice neighborhood, uh, but it had not been updated probably in the 15 years that this lady has owned the house. Mm -hmm. And when we gave the maximum offer, which was $90,000 in a house that all updated would sell for about $140,000 in this neighborhood, she said, you know, somebody offered me $140,000 for it. And my response was, I can appreciate that, but I guarantee they didn't offer you $140,000 as is. And she said, indeed, they wanted her to make all of these updates for the house. They wanted her to paint. They wanted her to redo the flooring. They wanted her to redo the you know, bathrooms. They wanted her to fix the deck in the yard, all of these things. So that maximum offer that you're going to make, it's a real offer. And some will, some won't, so what? Someone's waiting, right? Yeah, so I, what? Move that, on. So what? Next. There are um, all sorts of opportunities. All right, that's all I want yeah, to add. And, and just for you to know, um, sometimes I don't offer maximum offer because I don't feel good about it in the first place. It's just something inside that says, I don't know, don't know. And sometimes if my maximum offer is 70, I'll say best I can do is 62. And you know what? Here's another one. Some people say, yeah, fine, okay. And then I have other ones. I get to where I know my maximum, my maximum offer. Is like, what do you need? I just need to get out of the house. What do you owe? 50. I'll take over your mortgage. Now, he, and there's techniques about how you take over mortgage. When you say that to somebody, the first thing they thought, well, he's just a crook. <laughs> but I do it with an attorney that writes things up so that it relieves them of some liability. And we let the mortgage companies know that there's a new man in town, right, Don? That is correct. And um, I just wanna add that Robert Kim there is an expert in that also. <laughs> but um, yeah, you taught me that. I actually bought my first rehab house by taking over the mortgage. The lady, she was going to let it go back to the bank. And she was actually going to fork, let it go into foreclosure once and the bank talked her into doing a loan modification. Like so many people, she did not know what she was signing. After she signed it, she said, you know what? I just don't want the house. 
I said, okay, well, you know, it needs all of these repairs, so I can't give you anything for the house, but I'll take over the loan and it will save your credit. You won't have any late payments. You won't have a foreclosure on your house. He let me do it. We had it uh, drawn up by an attorney, put into a trust, sold the house recently. Now she's looking to buy another house and guess who her real estate is? Yeah, very good. So all of these things is kind of investor 101. And it's a lot to take over at one time uh, or accumulate in your mind. But um, uh, please, um, uh, we don't, don't mess yourself up um, going out there and not knowing what the cost of purchasing is. And starting out, when I started, I just did options. I just did options. Uh, basically, it just means they'll sell me the house for a certain amount of money. They are obligated to do that within a certain period of time. And if they don't, um, they sell it to somebody else, I can go against them. But they can't sell it out from under me uh, for that particular point of time. So in these little hour, hour and a half times, we don't have time to do all of that. But maybe one day, Donna, give us a weekend together where we can show you a technique in great detail and maybe even take you to a home we're doing. Um, so I could take you to the one with the foundation falling in. <laughs> and, and, and the worse the home smells, the more it smells like money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, the higher the, higher the we, I spent... I think it was right at $10,000 cutting the forest down and emptying a house uh, just a few months ago. Uh, we bought the house for $60,000, sold it for one hundred and twenty, dollars and I put $70,000 in it. That's a good payday. So do that math again. If you bought it for sixty and sold it for one hundred and twenty, that's only sixty thousand dollar profit. So how did you end up with seventy thousand dollars from that? It was no. I put seven. I put sixty in. I bought it and had sixty in it. Sold it for one hundred and twenty. So I made sixty thousand. That's poor math. Oh 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 oh. So you bought it and put up I bought to it sixty and, thousand. And I had sixty thousand dollars in it. Okay. Sold it for 120. It took us, we had two people bought it, fell out, and then the third one finished it. But it took us five months. I'm sorry, but we made $60,000 in five months. It was just awful. Okay. But um, the house, when this guy finished it, will be worth but I cut the trees down for him and emptied the house. I thought that was nice of him. And that's all you did, right? You just did mm -hmm. some landscaping and hired a few dumpsters and some people to clean the house out. Is that right? Yeah, it took 14 dumpsters to clean the house out. 14 dumpsters. That's a and lot made, of... And you made $60,000 off that sale because yeah, the yeah. after repair value in the neighborhood was what? How much was the after repair value in the neighborhood? Well, actually, the guy that bought the house had an appraisal done for after repair value. It came in at $315,000. So he bought it for one twenty, dollars but could possibly make $195,000 off this. Well, this house after comes his... $100,000 to fix. Okay. So well, he'll make $100,000. So he could make $100,000 off the sale. Uh, probably, mm -hmm. probably closer to eighty-five dollars after the realtor yeah. fees and everything. What a great payday. Yeah, so we all get paid. And you really want to do things like that. Your buyer, you want him to make money. Why would I want him to make money? Remember what I said right at the beginning? Make a buyer's list. Find out what they do, how much they can do, when they can do it. It's very important because wouldn't it be nice if you don't have to advertise and you don't have to go through real estate agents? You I'm, can I'm gonna, pick up your phone and say, hey, Bobby, I got a house. Come take a look. 
I'm, I'm going to yeah. add to that. I'm going to add to that. I have a database that I email on a regular basis. They are buyers and sellers. And the nice thing about working with investors is that investors buy and sell more than one house a year. And so the people that I keep in touch with, especially in a shifting market, sometimes right now it's a seller's market, there aren't a lot of houses to sell. And I've got investors who own rental properties who are calling me to help them sell their house. That database that you were, and I put these sales out to my cash buyers. And these people, I, I, I'm selling, I've sold, I've, I just sold one house to a cash buyer. And at the same time that he went under contract for that house, he went under contract for another uh, triplex. So I've got this cash buyer that I'm closing two deals on in about a month and a half. And mm -hmm. the seller is somebody that I've sold other uh, rental properties of his for. So if I didn't keep in touch with these people, then they would just find somebody else to work with. The database contacts are so important. It makes it makes buying and selling real estate that much easier. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to let Dawn have the rest of the show here. I'm sorry I took up so much time, but I hope that helped you guys a little bit with some information and knowing how to be careful and watch out what you're doing. So Larry, I'm going to keep you on here because we're going to talk a little bit about necessary repairs versus unnecessary repairs. So you walk through a house and you see, you know, some things, but one of, I think it's a rookie mistake and goodness knows I made this mistake because my first flip was I built a house more like what I wanted to live in versus what somebody else would live in. And it cost me a lot of money at the end of the day. You know, just just small little pennies, things like doorknobs instead of the stainless steel doorknobs. I wanted the black doorknobs and the black hinges and they're only pennies, but pennies add up to dollars and dollars add up to thousands of dollars um, mm -hmm. countertops. So I guess what I'm getting at is let's not outbuild the neighborhood. I've seen houses that have cork floors hardwood floors when in the neighborhood it's customary to have carpet, <laughs> yeah. right? I've That's seen right. granite countertops in the neighborhood where it's customary to have a laminate countertop. I've seen entire walls of drywall put in where it's been paneled, painted panel in the neighborhood. So. Larry, maybe because you have a lot more experience in this, could you give us a few examples of, of what yeah, not to uh, do? It's things like um, if the neighborhood, everything in the neighborhood is for mica countertop, you don't want to go put marble. Uh, you, it's not going to make that tremendous a difference in the value of the property. Um, I don't put new windows in every house. If the house, if the windows are in good shape, they open, they close, they look good, um, and the house isn't 100 years old, uh, I will probably leave the windows. Uh, yeah, let me ask you about that. Because the house that I bought, it, the windows were painted shut. They looked really good, but the windows were painted shut and some of the window locks were broken off. How could, how could I have remedied that as opposed to putting the windows in? You, people paint windows shut. I mean, <laughs> paint gets in there. So you get somebody or you can do it and make a tool that you can come down and clear out the paint and you can put new locks on. Um, just how, how much would something like that cost, the new window locks and such? Because I paid- Golly, you can go buy them for $3. About, yeah, $2,000 to have the windows installed. Yeah, you can buy the windows. new locks for- few dollars probably got the change in your pocket so they're not expensive any so i could have work. saved about two thousand dollars on my on my on my flip just yeah. by doing that yeah so um there's things like um 
people like bathrooms really nice. Um, and the tub looks awful. It's rusted and da 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 da. And so I'm going to put a new shower, a new tub in. You can have it recoded for $300 rather than spending $1,200 to put a new tub in. And I just saw that too in a flip house that I'm selling for this lady in Aiken, the real estate agent. She left the original bathtub in and it is messy, messy, messy. And that was some of the feedback we got. She just hired somebody to come in and all she did was refinish it for $300 and it looks brand new. Yeah, it looks really great. Those guys that do it, uh, you just can't go in the house while they're doing it. Uh, but uh, also floors. Sometimes if you you look under the carpet, it may be hardwood. And if the hardwood's in good shape, what's going to sell today is refinishing the hardwood rather than new carpet. Um, there's there's all kinds of like a, a new fixtures in a sink kitchen or something may be better than changing the whole kitchen out. Uh, light fixtures, sometimes just changing a fixture makes a whole difference in a room. Um, so you can go through and look at those things and wall colors, things like that. Um, go look at new houses on the market, the colors that sell. Uh, I used to say at one time, don't look at colors that smell, look at colors that sell. Um, some people think, you know, different colors, but contractors have spent money knowing what the market is right now on their wall colors. Did y'all know that? They do everything in gray and beige right now, gray and beige. Yeah, and some light blues. Light blues. Um, my wife is good. She says on the outside of a home, on the front, where you're looking at it, three colors. Three colors on the outside make the house speak. Just pick the right three colors um, in some kind of combination. Um, I can't overstress though, pine straw around the bushes in the front or something. You don't have to go spend a lot of money on the mulch and the bark and all. just pine straw neatly laid and tucked will get the trick done for the look. Um, a metal uh, wood deck in the backyard looks old and worn. Rather than replace it, if you power wash it and get some of these new stains and paints that go on it, they'll look brand new almost. A fence, wood fence, power wash it, clean it, it may look new. A roof may have stains and stuff on it but you can spend three or $400 on getting that roof cleaned instead of $5,000 for a new roof. So all of those things you look at to say, does it really need a new roof? Does it really need the whole outside painted? Maybe just paint the porch rails and clean up the shrubbery. So there's a lot of areas that don't need fixing now. Here's another thing that Chad and I do, but um, uh, I like added value, uh, Dawn. So if I go into a three bedroom, one bath home, I may be looking for a place that's there in existence that I can add another half bath or a bath. Sometimes you'll go into a, a master bedroom that it's a good size master and they got a deep closet that maybe you can take that closet and come out into the bedroom two or three feet and expand it a couple of feet toward the door and you can still have a closet and put a shower, a toilet and a sink in that bedroom. Now you've added, it takes, it takes I need a five by five area to do that. It's not a lot of space, is it? But you can do that in a five by five or a four by five area. And if you add that, it costs me when I'm doing it because of my contract is about three to $4,000. It will add 10 to the value of the house. 
don't add it if it doesn't add value. But if every if the other houses in the neighborhood are three, one and a half, or three, two, and yours is the three, one, get the value up. Find a way to do it. I'm not telling you to add a room on the back of the house. Um, I'll tell you of one that we did. Don, am I taking your time here? No, no, no. This is exactly what our topics are. Thank you. Okay. Um, we had one that there was a built-in shed to the back of the house. It's built into the back side of the house. And on the other side of that built-in shed was a washer dryer inside in a hallway. But they didn't have two baths. So, silly me, I decided that I'm going to go outside. I'm going to measure that room. It was four by seven. I said, ha ha. So I took everything out of that shed, put a floor into it level with the floor of the house. And in the bedroom where part of the wall was, I put a door. And that door now opened to where my new floor was that I added the bath. I still had the ceiling in there and the roof over it. I just put insulation, new tile in there, new floor, put a shower, commode, and a sink. And now I added a full bath. And it didn't cost $3,000. And outside, um, in that little utility shed, was where they kept the hot water heater. I moved the hot water heater three feet to the outside and put on the pad that was already there and put a little shed over it. So now the hot water heater's outside and I got a bathroom inside instead of a utility shed, but out in the backyard, they already had a metal building. So uh, when how, I got- How much value did you add to the house by doing that? 10 how much grand. Did, how much, 10? And it cost yeah. you three to do? Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I also took out a wall in this particular house that added value. When my, um, we didn't even have it on the market yet, but an investor had, or an investor, or agent had written by the house when we cleaned up the yard and all and asked if we'd call him when we were ready to sell it. So we did. He brought his buyer. His buyer stepped in the living room, stopped, and told his agent, We're buying this house. All he had seen was where we had redone the kitchen, taken a wall out, opened up the room. And when we went back in the back and saw the bathroom, he said, absolutely, I'm buying this house. And he paid us asking price value. And we had it. I think we sold that house for 136. There wasn't anything in the neighborhood that had sold before more than 130. So... And it had sold a year before and didn't look near as nice as ours. Your appraiser had no problem appraising it. So that's what you can do. Thinking beyond a little bit about what you see and putting it in the right neighborhood. Don't overprice the neighborhood. Um, I like to go into neighborhoods, buy houses, fix them up and price myself out of the neighborhood. Do. It's really easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, I guess other little fixes could be, I mean, well, I guess one of the true things when you watch those rehab shows on television is, is reuse what you can. If those kitchen yeah. cabinets are salvageable and all they need is paint and maybe some new hardware, then all they need is paint and new hardware. Yeah. If, uh, if, yeah, if there's hardwood under that carpet oh gosh bring out the hardwood bring out the hardwood uh, one of the things that i did was there was some wood paneling in the dining room and i took some drywall putty and i filled in the cracks of the paneling that old 1970s wood paneling i mm -hmm. took a hand sander and i sanded it smooth and then painted, painted over it. it, and you would never know that it was paneling. It looked exactly like drywall. Yeah. And, and the worst case, day. yeah, in the worst case, even if you just painted, it looks better. 
True. Yeah, exactly. Even even brown paneling painted looks better. Here's something else that uh, we have done, um, and it's a minimal cost, is, is sometimes these houses on the front, uh, you just walk up if it's pouring down raining on the side and it's pouring down raining, you get soaking wet before you can get in the door with your groceries. So we, a lot of times, will add something over the outside doorway uh, at a minimal cost. It's very minimal that attracts ladies because she don't, they don't like to be there with the kids or groceries in their hand getting soaking wet while they're trying to unlock the door. Um, other things that we've done is that uh, we have added a small deck on the side of a house where they've got a side door, no back door, but they got a side door and a, and a set of steps and a porch we will sometimes go by build an eight by eight or an eight by 10 deck so that people can go out their kitchen door on the side and go outside and cook on their deck because they have nothing in the backyard to do. Those are valuable things to people and they will pay more than the cost to get that deck on there or that little cover over the house for the convenience. Y'all with me? In and in a, some contractor wants to charge you a fortune for that, call me, I'll come build it. <laughs> uh, you're going to pay me twice what I usually do, but it's going to be cheaper than a contractor that's crazy. But uh, it doesn't cost much to do those little small things. Um, but anything you can reuse, anything you, painting doors in a house is cheaper than buying new doors. You know what I did with um, the, covered pulls and drawer handles in the kitchen is, I mean, they're already fitted perfectly for the cupboards. I just bought some primer, uh, spray primer, and then black spray paint, because right now black fixtures are all the rage, black doorknobs are all the rage. I took them outside, I primered them, and I spray painted them black, and I put them back on the cabinets after I painted the cabinets. Looks like a totally different kitchen, doesn't it? It does. It was a beautiful kitchen. Yeah. And sometimes if you know somebody that can do certain good things, uh, they like to take pride in stuff. I've got a contractor that uh, will build a small, small little island in the kitchen that doesn't take up a little, but a little bit of room. And they build it small enough that it gives them a little more counter space to put stuff on and they'll put a plug in it so you can put your pot roast on that little small 14 inch counter and gives them a little more counter spot to cook in and walk around. You no, know, and, and also you don't have to go shopping at the big box stores. There are lots of options. There are thrift stores, there's a Habitat for Humanity. I got all of the lighting fixtures. They were brand new in the box mm -hmm. at the Habitat for Humanity in Augusta. Between Augusta and Columbia, there are four Habitat for Humanity stores. Yeah, they're, so they're all you can the place. They, they buy and have things. Give you an idea, I needed a door for a house. Um, it was a, they had nice doors in there, but somebody had torn it up. And I went down to the secondhand place and they had brand new doors. And um, I said, how much are these doors? And the guy said, well, that's $35. I said, well, I can go buy a brand new one over at Lowe's for $40. Uh, what are you going to sell me this one for? He said, well, I need more than, uh, more than, you know, $10. I said, great, I'll give you five. He laughed at me. He said, what? I said, it's only worth $5. I'll go somewhere else. No problem. He said, take it. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that you can barter at thrift stores. You can also yeah. barter at the Home Depot and find more models of things and i mean my mom she is just the most amazing barterer ever she was at home depot she saw a front door that was originally about 350 dollars. she called the assistant over and said how much is this and he gave her a price and she was like mm, oh look at all these scratches it oh i can tell it's been worn and I don't know. I don't know. And he said, okay, well, how about 75? 
took it. So you never know. It's, you know, this is a biblical principle. You receive not because why? You receive not because you ask not. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to ask and you never know what they may say. And uh, we buy a lot of new appliances sometimes that uh, the side of it has been bumped by a truck or something, but everything works. If you're going to put it in a slot in a cabinet, it doesn't matter. Do you have a good place to get appliances like that, appliance packages that aren't box stores? Yeah, there. Well, there's a store here right down the street from our office, Don, that uh, has new appliances they buy. Um, I, when I was going to college, I owned a company called Unclaimed Freight, and I sold furniture. And manufacturers sometimes will send a truckload of whatever to a destination that either they didn't order it, the company's out of business, uh, or they, their account's been frozen, something's happened. And so they look for somebody that will take that merchandise. So this store will buy brand new stoves, refrigerators, dishwashers, and they will be selling them about 20 to 30% below what you may find in the normal store. But it's brand spanking new with a warranty and everything. They also have some used ones and they also do repairs. And sometimes they'll buy a used one from you. So those kind of stores are, they're all over the place. So. Um, yeah, always try to sell those old appliances. I bought a refrigerator for this house, the exact same model. It's an older model, but it was a specific fit. The person who sold me the refrigerator that went into the uh, house bought the refrigerator that I was removing from the house. So I think yeah. at the end of the day, I paid $75 for that refrigerator. And so look for bargains. It's okay. Uh, now, and depending on the house, if I've got a $300,000 house, I'm not going to put a refrigerator in that's dented. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a nice refrigerator. Now, if it's got a dent on the side and it's still brand new and it doesn't affect it, I'll probably tell the owner, refrigerator looks good. That side over here has a little dent. If it doesn't work, let me know. We'll replace it. So you can get by with that. People want to see what they see. If it looks good and sometimes has a little mark or something on the side, the back that doesn't affect it, it's okay. Um, so those are some tips. Um, as you guys get equipped with this, I, I hope that you'll let us know some of your activities, how many people you call before you get your first deal, uh, what your first deal is. Uh, I think I started by telling you Chad bought his first house when he was 17 illegally. You have to be 18 to buy a house. <laughs> no, you don't. You just have to be 18 to sign a legal contract. Well, he it wasn't is 18. voidable, but it's not void. Yeah, so he he they didn't void it. They wanted the money. <laughs> exactly, so, exactly. Actually, he was given to him. So uh, I don't wonder how he learned how to do that. Um, so guys, go out and look. Uh, let me tell you what I see coming up, though. Can I do this, Don? The market at some point here, with all the banks having properties that people are not paying the mortgages right now, that's going to come due. This virus is going to go away, and banks are going to start saying, I can't wait any longer to be paid. We're foreclosing. So there's going to be people in trouble that need to get out from their payment. And they're starting, we got some right now. So if you're smart and you have a way to put stuff on a website or anything, say behind in payments or get you a sign put on the street, call Rex. I buy houses. Um, don't use my sign, we buy houses. That belongs to me, it's incorporated. But you can say, I'm Rex, I buy houses. Behind on payments, call me. You see a vacant house, put a note on a door. Chad went and put a sign in front of a vacant house one time, says, I buy houses. 
the owner called and said, what's this sign doing in front of my yard with this phone number? He said, oh, yeah, I'm glad you called us. We don't know if you want to sell your house. We bought his house. Did you never Happened know? To me. That just happened to me. I uh, put a sign in front of a uh, house and been waiting for the people to call me. I've been wanting this house, and I just had a meeting with the owner the other day. So I'm going to follow up with him. Not only, not well, so the owner's son, right? The owner's son called me. So the owner is hunting right now. He's going to be back on Friday. The beauty of it is that they also have two other houses that they may want to sell. Now, here's something that's a different topic altogether. But one of the things, as you get accustomed, we were talking about families that pass, family members that pass away, and there's an estate. That information is available in the courthouse free of charge. So if you figure out how to do that, you can go down to the courthouse and you can contact whoever the person's in charge of that estate and see if they want to sell it. I look for out of state people. Why would I want to look for out of state? Because those are the people that don't usually want the house because there's nothing they can do with it. That's right. So that's my last tip of the night. So I'll let uh, Don have the rest of the time tonight. And I hope you guys uh, have gotten some information tonight. And I haven't confused you too much. It's been great. You've been great. I don't really know that there's anything I can add to this tonight. Does anybody know what time it is? It's about five or six minutes before eight o'clock. If five I got six. questions, let them ask some questions. Yep. Any questions? Um, I'm going to be posting this on our Facebook group. Uh, thank you, Zeria. I'm going to be posting this on the Facebook group. If you're not a member yet, then please go ahead and join. We are the Real Estate Investors of Columbia SC. Uh, all of these Zoom meetings get posted on Facebook. We get some deals posted on Facebook. We've got some hard money lenders. I think we just, we're almost at 400 members now. It's pretty amazing. I have to thank my mom for that. She's the one that oversees it. So when you see that big hearty welcome to Natasha Johnson, that's my mom, Linda. You say, thanks, Linda. <laughs> she does a really great job moderating. Uh, but it's a really great resource, uh, Bob Kim from the Midlands RIA group. They have another great resource for that. You see a lot of deals on that page also, and that would be Midland uh, Facebook group. It's Midland RIA Mastermind or Money Mind or something like that. You could email Bob or just uh, text Bob and ask him. That's about all I've got. Oh, go ahead, yeah, Rob. Real, Bob. real quick, just for consideration, you mentioned hard money lender. Yeah. Let's, let's pretend for a moment that house I bought for $60,000. And I had to go borrow money from somebody in 15% interest. So that if I borrowed $60,000 at 15%, that'd be $9,000 if I kept it for a year. But I made how much? 60. And how Even, long did you keep it? Five months. So I, I mean, it was our money, but even if I kept it for, for a year at six, it, I, if I'm making 60 and got to pay nine for money, I still made $50,000. You understand what I'm saying, Count The cost, is it worth the cost to get the money that you don't have to qualify with a bank? Is it worth it? Yes. And believe it or not, you know people with money. You just don't know you know people with money. You got to talk. Well, and a nice thing about hard money lenders, too, is you don't necessarily have to have perfect credit to no. work with a hard money lender. Because they're yeah. looking at the house as their collateral. And if you're buying it right, they're, they, heck, that kind of thing, I hope they default. Well, uh, not, not, not necessarily. They want, they want you to be successful. Yeah, they but want you to they understand that they default, they're not yeah. going to lose. Right, exactly. exactly. And, and I've got people that I know that have been investing with me for years. We pay them 7% if we use their money. That's better than 2% or 1% at the bank or 401k. So there's people that got money that would really 
like to talk to somebody like you if you're good at it and prove yourself they'll come to you time after time after time all right bob okay. did you want to throw something in there yeah I, I want you guys to talk at one of our meetings i remember uh chad had uh, mentioned was it like july or august but no, don I'll, I'll text your email you okay because i'd love to have you guys talk at one of our meetings well, you know, we need to interview you. I don't know if we've interviewed you. We have interviewed you for one of our meetings, haven't we? Well, I'm a pretty boring guy. So I probably no, wouldn't no, say no. That. This is the guy <laughs> that that bought a house subject to the owner keeping its existing mortgage and named the trust Our Lady of Perpetual Flatulence. <laughs> I, I was just having fun with the name. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to see if people were paying attention. So um, I appreciate that. Uh, if we haven't interviewed you, Bob, we definitely need to. We de maybe, yeah. ne let, 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 in fact, let's plan for that in June. We'd love, we'd love to uh, hear all of your secrets about subject to properties. And I mean, just so knowledgeable about so many other things. Ugh. We'll plan for that yeah. if you're available. No, I, I, appreciate every, I appreciate you letting me on these. These are great. I learn a lot from them. Well, that's what we're supposed to do, Robert. We're supposed to learn from each other. Anyone else with any questions? Okay. Well, All right. We'll go home. Thanks so much. Yeah. We'll go to sleep. <laughs>